Welcome to the final section of this course. In this section, we'll be covering generics in Swift and how we can use them with protocols in order to write powerful, maintainable, and flexible code. Last section, we covered associated type requirements, which are placeholders that conforming types can satisfy. We then covered self requirements, which describe the conforming type itself. Then we took a look at operator requirements, which allow the protocols to require that the type implement certain overloads for operators, where the conforming type is the operand of that operator. And then finally, we looked at where clauses in protocol extensions in order to constrain implementations so that they're only applicable to certain conforming types. In this section, we'll start with an introduction to generics, showing you what generics are and how you can use them. We'll then move on to showing you the power that the use of protocols can bring to generic functions and types. Then we'll move on to talking about how we can use protocols in order to refine extensions on generic types so that they're only applicable when a given placeholder meets the requirements. And then finally, we'll cover some of the powerful standard library protocols, such as equatable, comparable, and hashable. You'll be shown both how to conform to these protocols and then how to use them when writing generic code. So in this first video, we'll be introducing you to generics. You'll be shown how to define generic functions and generic types. Generics are somewhat similar to associated types, in that they allow you to define placeholders, which are then later satisfied. The difference between them is that while associated types are satisfied by a particular conforming type, generic placeholders are satisfied at the call site of the given function or generic type. So let's dive in with defining our own generic placeholders. You can add a generic placeholder to a function by writing a pair of angle brackets after the function name and before the parameter list. You can then define one or more generic placeholders between these angle brackets. So in this case, we have a pick random function that takes two arguments and returns one of them at random. So to do this, we've defined a generic placeholder t. We're then using this placeholder as both the argument types and the return type of the function. What this means is that when pick random comes to be called, the caller will have to satisfy the placeholder t with an actual type. This type will then be used as both the argument type and the return type. Therefore, in this case, you can see we're calling pick random with integers. Therefore, by default, t will be inferred by the compiler to be an int. Therefore, pick random will be inferred to be a function that takes two int parameters and returns an int. Therefore, i here will be typed as an int. And you can see in this case, when we're calling pick random, we're passing in string arguments. Therefore, the compiler will by default infer t to be a string, and therefore infer pick random to be a function that takes two string parameters and returns a string. Therefore, the result will be typed as a string. With functions, you must use a given generic placeholder and at least one of the places in the function signature. Otherwise, it doesn't serve any purpose and the compiler will give you an error. When you come to call the function, you then satisfy the given generic placeholder, which Swift can infer from the static type of the instance you pass. For example, you can see in this case, we have a print static type function, which has a generic placeholder t, which is then used in an argument of type t. You can see when we're calling this with a string, t is inferred to be a string. However, if we first cast the parameter to any, then t will be inferred to be any. We're able to print out the type of t in the function, because inside a generic function, you can access the metatypes of the types being used to satisfy the given placeholders. So for example here, you can see we're printing t.self, and this is the static type that the compiler infers t to be upon calling. So in this case, string, double, and any. The ability to access the static metatype of t in a function is especially useful when t is constrained to a protocol, which I'll be showing in the next video. It's worth quickly noting in this case, they would be more efficient to mark the arguments of pick random as being at auto closures. What this means is that the compiler will implicitly wrap the arguments in closures, therefore meaning the argument that isn't picked does not need to be evaluated as the closure will not be called. With generic types, you write the angle brackets after the type name. Unlike functions, you don't necessarily have to use the placeholder in any method or property types. However, just like functions, you have access to the static metatype of the given generic placeholder throughout the type, whether you're at instance or static scope. 
So for example, in this case, you can see we're accessing the static metatype of the generic placeholder elements at both static and instance scope. You'll note that we named the generic placeholder elements. While a common naming convention for generic placeholders is to use the letters T, U, and V, you are free to choose whatever name you wish. In fact, it's encouraged to give generic placeholders a meaningful name in places where it makes sense to do so. For example, if we consider array, which is a generic type and has a placeholder, just like in this case, called elements. However, in places where there's no descriptive name available, such as in the above example with pick random, the letters T, U, and V are the established convention. So back to generic types. You can see in this case, we have a collection of two type that describes a pair of elements. Because element is a generic placeholder, it will be satisfied when we come to create an instance of a collection of two. So for example, in this case, you can see we're explicitly satisfying the element placeholder with string. Therefore, we're creating a collection of two of strings. So you can see we're passing in two strings for both elements. However, in most cases, the compiler can infer what type you're using in order to satisfy the generic placeholder. For example, in this case, we're passing in doubles. Therefore, by default, collection of two is inferred to be a collection of two double. You can see that here. And you can see much the same thing with, for example, array literals. So in this case, this is inferred to be an array where the element type is satisfied by the type int. It's worth noting that when you refer to a generic type, you must provide a type to satisfy the placeholder, either implicitly by allowing the compiler to infer it, or explicitly. You cannot currently talk in terms of an arbitrary generic type irrespective of the type used as its placeholder. For example, I cannot directly have a variable of type just collection of two. That won't compile because the compiler needs to know what type we're using in order to satisfy the generic placeholder. Another case of when the compiler is able to infer the type used in order to satisfy the generic placeholder is when a generic type refers to itself in its own scope. For example, you can see here we have an extension of collection of two. Therefore, when we refer to collection of two inside this extension, the compiler will by default infer this to be a collection of two elements. And of course, elements is the generic placeholder of collection of two. So when this instance method is called, it will be returning a collection of two with a placeholder of the same type as it's being currently satisfied by. For example, calling it on a collection of two int will return a collection of two int. And you can see this method is just swapping the elements. Finally, it's worth noting that generic types are treated invariantly by the compiler. What this means is that two different specializations of a given generic type are treated as completely unrelated types, regardless of the type relation between the two different placeholder types. So for example, you can see here, we have a collection of two string. However, we cannot simply assign this to a collection of two any, because a collection of two string is a completely different type. The reasoning behind this restriction is because placeholders can be used as both parameter and return types for methods inside that type. This is problematic because functions are contravariant with respect to their parameter types and covariant with respect to their return type. A given generic placeholder, therefore, has to be invariant if it is to be used as both. For example, consider this class box with a generic placeholder element and a property of type element. This property has both a getter and a setter. Just like methods with return types, getters are covariant with respect to the property type. And just like methods with parameters, setters are contravariant with respect to the property type. So for example, consider if we had a box string. Now consider what would happen if we were able to assign this to a box any. We would now be able to set the elements to anything, including an integer. However, this is clearly illegal because box is a class and the element is of type string. Because we created a box string, therefore it would be illegal to assign an int to this. This should clearly show you why generic types are invariant. However, one special exception to this rule is with some standard library collection types, such as array. Despite being a generic type with a placeholder for its element type, you can still freely convert between arrays of subtype elements to arrays of supertype elements. 
So for example here, you can see we have an array of integers and we're able to convert this to an array of any. The reason why this is permitted is simply because the compiler performs the conversion for you behind the scenes. This conversion is safe for arrays despite using the element placeholder in both parameter and return positions because arrays are value types. So therefore upon converting, the resultant array is a copy of the original and therefore any changes to it cannot affect the original. The reason why the compiler cannot therefore roll this out to arbitrary value types is that an arbitrary value type can contain any number of generic reference types, which leads us back down the path of unsafe conversions. So, to recap, generic placeholders are defined in angle brackets after a function or type name. Generic placeholders are then satisfied by an actual type at the call site of where they're used. The compiler can often infer what you're satisfying the generic placeholder with. For example, with generic types, this can be done when you're initializing the type by passing in an argument of placeholder type. You cannot talk in terms of a generic type without its placeholder. When you refer to a generic type, you must include a type in order to satisfy the placeholder. And finally, generic types are invariant. Two different specializations of the same base generic type are seen as completely unrelated types. However, the compiler makes exceptions for this in the case of some standard library collection types, such as array and set.